Hello, my name is Charles Plourd, and you've received this video presentation as a follow-up to the videos I've already mailed to all of you. You are under no obligation to do anything, and I don't want your money. I have some of my own, and I'm not asking you to join a club or a church or any organization. I realize that you're a reasonable and intelligent person, and I just want you to watch these video presentations and carefully consider and think about the things which I present and the documentation which I show. This particular video in my Alternate Reality Unchained series addresses the family line of a man featured in the Bible as being one of Noah's three sons named Ham. When we look into the 10th chapter of the book of Genesis in verses 6 through 20, we will be able to construct from the information found there a genealogical table which tells us in some detail who the descendants of Noah's son Ham were. Though it is somewhat lengthy, if we were to make a family tree, a table based on the information found in the text of the Bible concerning Noah's son Ham, that corresponding table would look something like this. According to Genesis chapter 9, verse 24, this man named Ham was Noah's youngest son. While the name of this man readily reminds me of one of my favorite smoked meats, I will refrain from making further references to it. For reasons which will shortly become very obvious, uh, Ham is the most likely progenitor of the people of Egypt, as well as many other people on the African continent. In this video segment, I will demonstrate this by using sources outside of the Bible, which have nothing to do with Christianity or Judaism, and are therefore not biased in favor of Christianity, as I myself am. Since these sources are not arguing for Christianity, or the Bible, or any religion at all. We must conclude that they are not therefore influenced by my Christian bias. In fact, I have decided to use these sources to show the reliable truth and factual basis of what I am presenting to you in this video series and to demonstrate that my video presentation is presenting evidence from secular or non-religious sources which confirm my conclusions on these ancient names of people groups, cities, and nations. I will now begin my examination of Ham's family line. As before, in cases where there is insufficient evidence, none at all, or only speculation and conjecture, I've decided not to include those names which appear in this table. Uh, since Ham's grandson Nimrod was already mentioned in video number two, I won't include him here again in this video. Ham himself will be examined later, but first we will look at his descendants. As we saw a moment ago, the name of Noah's youngest son was Ham. The Bible goes on to tell us that Ham's first son was named Cush. The text of the Bible reads in this manner on this point. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. As an observant person, you will recall that since the Bible and secular history are more or less in agreement on the fact that all civilization originated in Sumer of Mesopotamia, we must begin there to discover Ham's son named Cush. The secular or non-religious history would tell us that around 3100 BC there existed a city in Sumer named Kish. 
not more than 10 miles east of ancient Babylon in modern-day Iraq. An archaeological artifact known as the Sumerian King List states that Kish was the first city in ancient Sumer to have an established line of kings following a literal and catastrophic global flood. An event which is mentioned by the people of ancient Sumer as well as by people of almost every nation in the ancient world. You may not want to believe that the world was flooded with water in the ancient past, but as an intelligent person, you certainly need to carefully observe that over 200 ancient accounts of a global flood exist from all over the world. You may want to write these off as the nonsense mythology of a stupid and uh, primitive people, but that's really dismissive, and it's just too easy to do that. You cannot explain why the entire world and all of its people in ancient times, many of whom never knew each other, would all record that a global flood happened, just as the Bible indicates in its pages. The Bible includes many details which are never mentioned in any of the ancient flood accounts, from other parts of the world, such as the length of time that the water covered the crust of the earth, how mountain ranges formed under the floodwaters while the earth's crust moved away from fault lines, why we even have fault lines and volcanoes in the first place, and how underground aquifers burst onto the surface of the earth from these fault lines, uh, why at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, there is an extremely enormous scar in the Earth's crust, a rip in the crust of the Earth, and many other details which can today be seen from a very careful study of geology. In order to understand these undeniable features of our planet, you need to understand what the Bible states about the global flood. Only then will you get a proper understanding of how these things could have happened on the grand scale which many geological features of the planet bear witness to today. People today debate about what killed off the dinosaurs and there isn't any shortage of uh, theories on how this would have occurred. What the Discovery Channel, NOVA, uh, National Geographic, the science textbook at your local public school, and many government-funded organizations will tend to not mention very often is that it was not only dinosaurs that lived when the dinosaurs lived. Uh, what I mean by that is that there are many animals which evidently lived alongside the dinosaurs. Uh, you find this out when you dig down into the geologic layers of Earth's crust, which the dinosaurs are found in, and then you find that there were other creatures living alongside them, many of which still exist today, just in a smaller form, smaller size. Uh, that isn't men mentioned very often, and if it is, they, they use the Latin uh, name for that creature. It's uh, a name, uh, the scientific name for that creature, which makes it seem like it's different, uh, just because they give it a different name. But in fact, it's the very same creature. Um, you know, you have, for example, a beaver 
that existed long ago. Same, basically same as we have today, but they call it by a different name. And so many people think that it's an entirely different creature, which it isn't. It was just bigger than it is today. And once you understand what the world was like before the flood, you will understand how uh, many creatures, including the dinosaurs, could have gotten so large. If you have different atmospheric conditions, then it, it would be possible to make uh, many creatures much larger than they are today, including plants. We have to understand that a global flood would indeed kill all of the creatures on the planet and bury them in the same layers of mud that are being dug up today and which uh, contain dinosaurs. In fact, dinosaur blood was even found in a T-Rex bone some years ago. And scientists scratch their heads in bewilderment while many Christians, who are often cast by the media as being superstitious and simple-minded, uh, just simply nodded their heads knowingly. You know, we, <laughs> we know why you can find a T-Rex bone with blood in it. It's, uh, it's not going to last for millions of years, as many of the scientists claim that it would or should have or must have survived uh, in order to be found today. The scientific world is still reeling from the discovery of actual Tyrannosaurus rex cells and soft tissue unearthed last week at a Montana excavation site. It's a tremendous find that scientists say could unlock the mysteries of extinction and could one day lead to real-life dinosaur clones. Is that well, amazing to find this kind of soft tissue in a fossil this old? And what can the soft tissue really tell us? Um, well, it is, it is, it's very amazing. It's, uh, utterly shocking, actually, because it flies in the face of everything that we understand about how tissues and cells degrade. Uh, it's not something that any one of us could ever predict or hope it's, for. Um, it was significantly smaller, but it was also significantly older. And if I'm remembering what Jack told me correctly, it is the first appearance of Tyrannosaurus rex. It's so, therefore, it's the geo geologically, it's the oldest T-Rex on record. An intelligent and cautious person like yourself will quickly realize that blood in a T-Rex bone isn't going to survive four millions of years in the dirt. Okay, that just doesn't happen today. And so why would you expect it to happen in the past? Why would you expect it to happen at all? So uh, people who believe in evolution, however, uh, they, they want to say that this could have happened, but they can't explain how it happened. Um, so I will fully and exhaustively examine certain questions like that in a future video. And uh, I'm sorry I kind of sidetracked over there, but let's get back on track and return to the topic at hand. From history, we can know that the ancient kingdom of Cush included parts of Upper Egypt. According to historical and archaeological evidence, the kingdom of Cush ruled parts of Egypt and Ethiopia for some time. The area known as Cush is now northern Sudan. In ancient times, the existence of Cush and the Cushite people, both of which seem to be named directly after Noah's grandson named Cush, was without dispute and today is attested to heavily by archaeological and historical evidence both from Egyptian and Greek artifacts and writings as well as other ancient sources. And the people who dwelt in the kingdom of Cush were called Cushites at the first and a particular king of Cush named Kashta, which means simply the Cushite, invaded and conquered Egypt and actually ruled as the 25th dynasty pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, king Ezrahaddon and his son Azurbanipal of Assyria, who I mentioned back in uh, video number two, would ultimately drive the Cushites from Egypt. Mentuhotep II, is recorded to have battled with the Kushites as far back as the 21st century before Christ, which is only a few hundred years after the Bible records the global flood to have occurred. Uh, and falls well within the framework of when the Bible says uh, that the Kushites should have first appeared in Africa. In early Greek testaments, the land of Cush also included parts of Ethiopia with Ethiopians sometimes being a standardized term used by the Greeks to describe 
the people of Egypt and the lands of the south in Africa. Meanwhile, the Semitic peoples of Lower Asia referred to the people of Cush specifically as the Cushites. Since the ancient historian Titus Flavius Josephus wrote on this very topic, I will turn to him for his view on the kingdom of Cush. The following record, uh, written by the hand of Josephus, comes to us from approximately 2,000 years ago. For of the four sons of Ham, time has not at all hurt the name of Cush. For the Ethiopians over whom he reigned are even at this day, both by themselves and by all men in Asia, called Cushites. So here we see that at the time of Josephus's writing, uh, the very specific people group in Africa were called Cushites, both by themselves and by the numerous groups of people in the Asiatic lands. Uh, this also tells us that the kingdom of Cush was well known to ancient people. Uh, the reason for this, I suspect, is because Cush, the grandson of Noah, was a real person. And for uh, this reason, he had a kingdom named in his honor, which later became a nation on the African continent. Alternately, there is located in Pakistan today uh, a mountain named Mount Kush and a similarly named Kushi Mountain also in Pakistan. It is useful then to point out that it is well within reason to assume that the descendants of Noah's grandson Kush could have divided into their different groups and tribes and easily migrated then to Egypt, Ethiopia, and modern-day Pakistan from a central location in uh, ancient Mesopotamia, uh, perhaps even Sumer. And uh, this would likely account for the name of Noah's grandson being preserved in Pakistan as well as Egypt and the African Kingdom of Kush. Heth is the great-grandson of Noah through the lineage of Ham's son named Canaan. From this man came a people called the Hittites, who were probably called the Hethites previously. They are mentioned in the Bible as being the enemies of the ancient Israelites on many occasions. They occupied the ancient region known as Anatolia, or Asia Minor, whose location is in modern-day Turkey. They are referenced in the Armana letters of Egypt as the kingdom of Keta. Until the early 1900s, those who doubted the Bible supposed that the Hittites were a fictional people invented by the writers of the Bible, and therefore that anyone who believed in their literal existence in history was either uneducated or naive. Christians have often been portrayed in this way for believing that the Bible is true. However, as is the case on so many other topics, and on such numerous occasions, before their ancient civilization was unearthed by the archaeologist Spade, the Bible was in fact the only place that you could read about the Hittites or even know about their existence. And in 1884, a man named William Wright found some clay tablets with writing on them in the area of the world where uh, the Hittites would have lived in Turkey, in uh, ancient Anatolia. In 1906, a German archaeologist named Hugo Winkler found many more tablets, and by 1912, they were deciphered. It was at this point that the Hittites officially became known to the people of the world as a literal people that existed in ancient times in the exact location that the Bible said that they existed. And this was a truth which the Jews and Christians uh, already accepted prior to this time as being a factual reality. Zidon was the great-grandson of Noah, and I would suggest that given the age of Sidon and its location, that it was named in honor of him, Sidonia, 
was an ancient port city of the Phoenicians and was established about 25 miles south of modern Beirut in Lebanon. It's worth mentioning that the name of the city itself, Sidonia, would literally mean the land, uh, territory, or city of Sidon. Okay, so that's what Sidonia means. The city still exists today as Sidon with inhabitants and is well known with its history literally reaching back into the earliest times in human history. This is why I feel very confident in suggesting that this city called Sidon is in fact named for Noah's actual great-grandson who himself was named Zidon. So Sidon and Zidon, anybody can see the linguistic relationship there. And so you don't need to uh, really be a, a scholar or have a, an education at a university to notice this. Okay, this is just plain common sense. Philistim was the great-great-grandson of Noah. In ancient times, Palestine was known as Philistia. Here, you can see the greater similarity between the name of Philistia and Noah's descendant, Philistim. The Romans first began to call Philistia, Palestina a precursor to the name of Palestine used today to refer to the people uh, from which the Palestinians originated, an area which covers the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and Israel. Canaan was a grandson of Noah. His name is famously mentioned on many occasions in the Bible as being attributed to a land which once was and was known by the average person in ancient times to have existed at an even earlier time in history. The land of Canaan may have been constituted by modern day Lebanon, Israel, Palestinian territories, the western part of Jordan, and southwestern Syria. Ancient Near Eastern and Egyptian references to Canaan are in the later part of the Bronze Age and suggest that all of the neighboring lands knew the land of Canaan by the very same name which Noah's grandson bore, leading to the obvious conclusion that the land of Canaan, known in ancient times, was named directly after Noah's great-grandson. The Encyclopedia Britannica mentions Canaan as a historical region in the Middle East. As stated previously, Ham was the name of Noah's youngest son. Though its exact location is unknown, Hamazi was an ancient kingdom somewhere near ancient Assyria and is mentioned in several ancient cuneiform writings. Its first notable mention was on an ancient vase wherein the victory of a king of uh, the formerly mentioned kingdom of Kish is commemorated in a very old style of cuneiform. The Hamazi kingdom gets another notable mention in an uh, old Sumerian epic story called And Merkur and the Lord of Arata wherein an account is given of a conflict between two ancient Sumerian kings and uh, in the ensuing story there is mention of uh, the building of a great ziggurat uh, pyramid uh, tower and uh, the incantation or some spell spoken to either restore or remove the unity of languages which is what the Bible says actually happened at the Tower of Babel Okay. That's where we get all the languages in the world today, is from the Tower of Babel. So, maybe you don't believe that, but you would then have to ask the question as to why, um, in ancient times, you, you have the formation and appearance of a lot of different languages, literally from out of nowhere, and they appear suddenly. 
Well, this indicates that the languages had to appear from out of nowhere, which is what the Bible says. Okay, because if you believe in the evolutionary paradigm that everything appears gradually over time, then that would also have to be true of languages and writing. And uh, you can't find anywhere in ancient history how a language formed. Okay, it just they all appear suddenly, they all appear fully formed. Uh, maybe not always with writing and alphabet, but uh, people appear suddenly who know how to speak and they speak different languages all over the world. So based on all the other uh, writings which mention the Hamazi, it is believed to have flourished at around 2000 BC or so. So uh, that would be a time only removed from the global flood as the Bible states it happened. Um, about two or three hundred years. So that's very close to the time when Ham would have actually lived. And that concludes my presentation on the genealogy of Noah's son named Ham. The next video presentation on this DVD will concern itself with Noah's son Shem. And as I promised in an earlier video, we will travel to ancient China and examine the ancient Chinese language, uh, which seems to have encoded into some of its characters the very stories which are described in the Bible. The conclusion of these things will shock you and will readily testify that what the Bible is telling us concerning the origin of humanity and prehistory and a global flood is actually true and accurate. I've inserted a break into the presentation here so that if you want to watch this at a later time, you will be easily able to come, to come back to this point in the DVD. And this will actually be the last uh, presentation of the family lines of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so that will conclude the, the topic. Uh, let's move on to this next segment in this disc. And we'll talk about Noah's son, Shem.